As John quickly mentioned, uh, I am the founding director of the Brexit Institute, uh, which is Ireland only and Europe first center specifically created to analyze Brexit uh, from both, uh, both a research uh, and a policy perspective. Uh, we are institutionally funded uh, by Arthur Cox, uh, AIB, Grant Thornton, and now also Dublin Airport Central. And I think over the last few months, uh, we've really become the go-to place for businesses that want to have an impartial uh, and informed understanding of the Brexit uh, dynamics. So what I would like to do uh, this morning, what I've been really asked to do, uh, is of course uh, to focus on the most recent developments uh, in the Brexit negotiation and trying to think about uh, what might happen uh, in the next uh, future, in the near future. But I want to put that uh, within a broader context, trying to understand how Brexit came about, because I think uh, uh, this will help us uh, try to identify some uh, important trends uh, in the way how the United Kingdom has been interacting with the European Union over the years, uh, which I think uh, will allow us to potentially uh, identify a future forward which connects also with the broader debate uh, on the future of Europe. So I'd like just to structure my presentation uh, in uh, five parts, and I'm going to take basically a historical perspective. Uh, I'll take a step back and start from the past, looking how Brexit came about. Uh, I'll then move to the present, seeing where we are now and what are the challenges we are facing. And then I'll move forward to think about the future, both in terms of EU-UK relations uh, after the withdrawal from the European Union, but also the future of Europe, the 27 member states, including Ireland, uh, once the UK will have left. And then I'll try to conclude showing how really the future of EU UK relations and the future of Europe are deeply intertwined. So I think when looking at Brexit, uh, we really have to place the referendum of June 2016 in a longer historical relation that Britain has had with the European Union. As you know, uh, the UK joined in 1973, uh, what was then the European Economic Community, together with, uh, with Ireland. And as you also certainly know, in 1975, there was already a first Brexit referendum. Uh, the British government asked the British people in 1975 whether they wanted to remain in the European Economic Community. But what is very interesting is actually the question on the ballot uh, in 1975, because the question was, do you want to be a member of the common market? Question mark. And that is quite significant because it's true that in 1973, 1975, the European Union was mostly the common market, but it was by no means only the common market. So I'd say the UK somehow misunderstood what the project of integration was all about, thinking it was exclusively an economic enterprise. And that original misunderstanding became very evident from the 1990s, particularly from the Treaty of Maastricht, when the common market was supplemented with a big step forward in integration, the creation of the European Union, European citizenship, the Euro, common foreign and security policy, cooperation in the field of justice and home affairs, all issues which are political rather than economic uh, in nature. Uh, and these issues had actually been there since the very beginning, after World War II in the 1950s. But of course, with Maastricht, they resurfaced uh, in the structure of European integration. And from that moment onward, basically, the UK started being a problematic partner within uh, the European Union. And what we get is a number of attempts by the UK to somehow de detach itself. Uh, from uh, the EU structure. So the majority of member states move forward in creating a euro, but the UK gets an opt-out uh, to maintain sterling. The majority of member states move forward in creating a free movement zone, Schengen, but again, the UK uh, gets an opt-out uh, from that. Uh, and the UK also opposes any further efforts uh, in integration, and under Prime Minister David Cameron, it even seeks to renegotiate uh, its position, seeking other opt-outs from the uh, European Union. So if, if you consider this background, it isn't that surprising that 
when the referendum happened in June 2016, actually, the British people voted to leave the European Union. Now, I have to confess, when I woke up on the 24th of June 2016, I was shocked myself. But what I'm trying to say here is that, obviously, that referendum was the result of a long process of increasing uh, difficulty uh, by the UK in participating into a project that had become very political, too political, from a British perspective. Now, what has happened since then is history, and I'm sure you're very well familiar with that. In March 2017, uh, the UK government notified its intention uh, to leave the European Union under Article 50 of the treaties, and that opened the negotiations. Uh, the European Union insisted on dividing the negotiations in two phases, a first one uh, looking at the divorce, so the past, and a second one uh, looking at uh, the future. Uh, phase one may mainly focused on three issues, the protection of citizens, rights, uh, the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland, and the financial settlement. Uh, and the second phase instead was mostly focused on looking at the future framework uh, of relation. Uh, the big step forward was in December 2016, 2017, uh, when the two parties agreed at the diplomatic level on, on uh, how to settle the most controversial issue. And that led last year uh, to uh, extensive negotiation that culminated in uh, November 2018 uh, when the UK and the EU jointly published a full withdrawal agreement which includes the famous Northern Irish backstop. That's an international treaty regulating the exit of the UK. And to the side of the withdrawal agreement, uh, the two parties also, also strike a deal on a political declaration on the framework of future uh, relations. Uh, as you all know, uh, in these two documents, uh, the EU uh, really uh, leveraged its weight. Uh, so a lot of the EU priorities ended up being codified into these two documents, whereas the UK had to swallow a number of things which were legally and politically challenging uh, to accept. And here we come to what has happened on Tuesday this week when the British Parliament, as you know, uh, voted down uh, this deal, this combined package of a withdrawal agreement together with a framework of future relations. So where are we now and what can be uh, the uh, scenarios ahead? Of course, I don't have the crystal ball, but I think it's likely uh, to uh, point out at least four options uh, which are on the table short term. Uh, the default option is really a hard Brexit. Uh, therefore, the UK leaving the EU with no deal on the 29th of March uh, this year, so 10 weeks from, uh, from today. And the previous speaker mentioned that uh, from a government perspective, it's crucial to be prepared to that. Now, nobody really wants a hard Brexit, but the clock keeps ticking. And if there is no solution by the 29th of March, by default, the UK will be out of the EU uh, with no deal. So what's the alternative? The alternative could be for the British government to ask for an extension under Article 50, uh, basically keeping the UK within the EU beyond March uh, 29th, 2019. Uh, but the big question here is an extension to do what? The UK would need to ask for it. The European Union would unanimously have to grant the extension. Uh, and I think in principle, the EU would do it. But there is a big constraint on the EU side, which is the fact that uh, at the end of May this year, as you know, we have European Parliament elections. And that's a big problem because if the UK remains a member state in May, it will have to have European Parliament election. And I think it's very hard from a European perspective to accept the idea that a withdrawing member state will be participating to European Parliament election, by the way, uh, electing the third largest national delegation in, in Strasbourg. Uh, so I think there is little wiggle room there uh, for, uh, for an extension. So the option of a new vote also should be considered. Uh, if you failed, uh, try again. Uh, but of course, the math uh, and the defeat that Theresa May suffered on, on Tuesday uh, suggests that this is not going to, uh, to be easy. Uh, and this is why I think we should not exclude another a possible scenario ahead, uh, which is a kind of off-the-shelf solution for Britain with only 10 weeks to go, 
very limited space to renegotiate, no one willing to leave without uh, a deal, uh, the UK might opt for something that already exists, uh, the Norway solution, basically joining the European economic area, which would allow the UK to formally leave the European Union and so honor the result of the referendum, but maintain close economic ties uh, to the internal market just exactly as it's the case for Norway, uh, Iceland, and Liechtenstein uh, today. And I, I understand that option would get the votes of the Labour opposition, so it's possibly something uh, that uh, might, uh, might actually uh, become a feasible solution in the next uh, few days. Now, this actually points out to uh, the future, because I think what we have witnessed in the last uh, few months uh, is an interesting convergence on the big trends, the long-term dynamics in the relations between uh, the European Union and the United Kingdom. Uh, of course, the withdrawal agreement would have codified as, par as part of the package deal a transition period going from this year to the end of 2020, but extendable beyond that, which essentially was a kind of Norway Plus solution. Uh, the UK was remaining, would, would have remained in the uh, EU internal market uh, while leaving the EU institution, uh, and it would also have remained within the EU uh, customs union. So a solution not unlike the one that Norway and Switzerland benefit of today. And beyond 2020, despite uh, the uh, ambiguity of the political declaration, certainly the two parties uh, have signaled their intention of developing a close economic partnership. Uh, the UK has spoken about a deep and special partnership and the European Council of as close as possible a partnership. Now, uh, this is hard to grasp perhaps, but I think it really indicates the interest in developing a new model of economic cooperation outside the European Union, but which maintains uh, a third country closely connected uh, to the EU trade uh, and economic uh, area. And this perspective, uh, I think, becomes particularly relevant if we now look uh, within the EU at 27. In fact, uh, as you know, the European Union is not only dealing uh, with Brexit at the moment, there are multiple crises uh, within the EU, uh, the euro crisis, uh, the migration crisis and the rule of law crisis, which have left a very big legacy uh, in the functioning of uh, the European Union uh, at 27. And all these crises have different origin, but at the end of the day, uh, I think they have emphasized a big tension among the 27 on what is the finality of the project of European integration. Uh, and in, if we were to oversimplify a bit, uh, I think among the 27, there are two big visions for the future of Europe. One that sees Europe exclusively as a market project, and another one that instead sees Europe mostly as a, a political project. And uh, this tension, what I'm trying to point out, exists within the EU even after the UK will have left. Of course, Britain was the most vocal member state in uh, making the case for Europe just to be a huge free trade area, but there are lots of other countries that actually share the very same vision. Scandinavian countries, Central and Eastern European countries, and some Southern countries uh, which are uh, flouting uh, common rules uh, on economic uh, and political uh, affairs. So if that tension is still there, what I think Europe might be facing uh, in the years ahead is really a kind of reorganization. I call it here a grand bargain, where we might be witnessing a much more clear differentiation between a core Europe, which is political in nature and has uh, a much more explicit federalist, if you wish, ambition, and a peripheral Europe, uh, which instead remains connected exclusively through the means of the internal market. Now, this is a grand scenario, this Europe of concentric circles I'm trying to uh, describe to you. It is a doable scenario in legal terms, and I'm a lawyer myself, so I'm always keen to emphasize this. But the point here is that it is a scenario which might allow the UK, together with a number of uh, reluctant uh, EU member states, 
to remain closely tied to the EU internal market, which of course, from a business perspective, would be ideal. We cannot hope the Brits or the Danes or the Poles to become Euro-Federalists, but we certainly want them to be part of an internal market where goods, uh, capital and services uh, can move uh, freely. Business has, has an interest in that. And, and if, if we look at the broader dynamics in Europe, it's clear that we are simultaneously experiencing the disintegration uh, of uh, the periphery, Britain being the best example of that, but also the greater integration of the core. Think of what President Emmanuel Macron of France is trying to do. And so how do you reconcile these complex tensions? Well, uh, a Europe of concentric circles might be the way to do it. The core, to me, would inevitably be the Eurozone, uh, which already has a depth of integration uh, which is unparalleled. And the outer circle then would become the rest of the European Union, but also the UK that could have a space there, as well as uh, other countries, for example, those of the European Free Trade uh, Area and the EEA. So to conclude here on my, uh, on my uh, remarks today, what I think uh, we need to acknowledge is that the future of EU-UK relations uh, after Brexit is deeply interconnected with the future of Europe, even without the UK. These two dynamics, uh, these two processes are going on in parallel, and the reason why they are going on in parallel is that the British question, this historical uneasiness of the UK in being part of a political project is just the mirror image of the European question. What do we want Europe to be? Is it just an economic project, or does it have a political uh, ambition? And these two visions aren't going to go away. There's not one vision which will prevail over the other anytime soon. So I think uh, it's inevitable at some stage that Europe will have to reconcile these two different visions. Uh, and a model of concentric circles could be the way to solve the tension between market and polity. You would have a core, which is much more explicitly political, and a periphery, an outer circle, uh, which is instead exclusively market-focused, uh, and the UK could be there. And I think, as business leaders, uh, the ambition should be to keep the UK there, as I've been trying to suggest. Uh, every signal, uh, if we avert the risk of a hard Brexit, shows that it's in everyone's interest to that, for that to be uh, the case. So that's obviously the long term. In the short term, we do have challenges. We certainly also do have opportunities, particularly in a country like Ireland. Uh, therefore, let me just conclude by mentioning that we at the Brexit Institute at DCU are very much uh, engaged uh, in uh, helping and supporting businesses prepare for uh, Brexit and what comes next. And among others, I want to bring to your attention this executive training seminar that we are offering on the 4th and the 5th of April this year on Brexit finance uh, and trade. Uh, this is uh, actually uh, part uh, and consistent with the Government of Ireland uh, Brexit preparedness uh, program, and it's possible to use support from a number of agencies uh, to participate to that. So I would encourage, of course, uh, any business leader or uh, a manager uh, who is interested in getting uh, training and, uh, and a crash course and preparation on what the effects of Brexit will be uh, for its sectors, particularly here, uh, finance and trade, uh, to look us up uh, on the website that it's here uh, and possibly to contact us if, if you are interested in participating. And I'll stop here and I thank you very much for the invite again.